tests needed to be diagnosed with celiac disease. Um, many of you out there right now might be questioning whether or not you have celiac disease or gluten sensitivity. It's important not to start a gluten-free diet um, prior to being tested. So hopefully you'll understand why as we talk about this. It's going to be a little bit lengthy. I'm going to try to be as clear as I can. Um, so hang in there with me because it's very important. Also, all of this information came from a lecture by Shelly Case who wrote The Gluten-Free Diet. So I just want to um, credit her for giving me this knowledge. Um, there are three different kinds of testing in celiac testing. It's a blood test, a biopsy test, and a genetic test. We're going to go through each one. The blood test, um, it's a screening test, and it's not 100% accurate, as you'll find with a lot of the celiac tests, which is unfortunate. Um, it's the IgAEMA test. And it's very specific and sensitive to celiac disease, but can be falsely negative in people who do not produce IgA or children, young children, mostly under three, who don't um, produce IgA either, or um, who don't mount the IgA response. Um, it's also not an automated test, so it has to be read by a technician, and they need to be very familiar with celiac disease, obviously, to read it in this kind of somewhat confusing test. So a lot of the doctors are switching to a TTG test, which stands for um, a tissue and transglu transglutaminate test. Also highly specific and sensitive to celiac disease, um, and it will also have a false negative in people with IgA deficiency and young children who don't mount IgA, um, the IgA response. Can also be falsely positive for other autoimmune diseases, and but this test is automated, unlike the IgA EMA test. Um, and they have seen inter lab variations, so experts are trying to see why it hasn't been consistent from lab to lab. But those are the two main blood tests the IgA EMA and the TTG. Um, they correlate with the degree of villus atrophy. So basically, when you have celiac disease and you eat gluten, your little villi, which are little finger-like projections, which grab the nutrients so your body can absorb it, have been worn down. So they're more like this. And that's why people with celiac are malnourished. So this tests the villus atrophy. So a person who is older and has had tons of villus atrophy is going to be easier, more easily diagnosed than a person who has not um, had as much villus atrophy, if that makes sense. Um, so people with early CD, or sorry, celiac disease, um, the TTG may not be positive, IgA, EMA might, might not be positive, and some physicians will order an IgA, um, a serum IgA level, because one to four people with celiac disease are IgA deficient, and these tests are IgA dependent. Um, these will be falsely negative in those cases, obviously, if you're not producing IgA and it's an IgA deficient. I mean, dependent test. Sorry, it's very confusing. Um, as always, if you have questions, feel free to email me. We can talk it out over the phone, via email, if you need more clarification. Um, Tinsley at celibo.com. Um, and the last set of antibodies are the IgG and IgA anti-gliadin antibodies. They're not nearly as accurate as the other tests. Um, you can get a lot of false positives for other gastrointestinal um, issues like parasites, like giardia, or allergies to cow's milk or soy milk. Um, and they're not useful, and most labs are not doing it. But it, it is out there, but most labs aren't doing it. Um, something that's so interesting I found out about. In Canada, there is a company called Biocard, and they do a Biocard celiac test kit which I, I think you can order to have in the States. I don't know if your doctor will recognize it, but it's basically a, like a home pregnancy test in the sense that you actually prick your finger and take a little blood and you'll get a, a test result right there. And you obviously, whatever, if the result is positive, you need to follow it up with your doctor to get a, an actual diagnosis. But I thought that was absolutely amazing to be able to test for this at home. That's how prevalent this is. And people are finally getting that. Um, so it just says like TTG, you take a finger prick, it's got to be followed up to get, a, get on the road to diagnosis. It's about 50 Canadian dollars and it's an over-the-counter, we could get it at CVS or Dwayne Reed. Um, and I'll post the link to look at the website again. I'm not sure if you can order it, um, but you can certainly check out the website and glean more from that. Okay, biopsy testing. This is crucial because blood testing is so all over the place you need to get a biopsy test. That's the only way to truly confirm celiac disease. 
And a lot of people will say, oh, no, I've been scoped, you know, I had a colonoscopy. Fortunately, that is the wrong intestine they're looking at. You need to have an endoscopy so they can look at the small intestine. That is where the villus atrophy occurs. Um, and here's, this is very important. So if you're watching and you think you're going to go get tested, take out a pen. You need to ask your gastroenterologist or whoever is administering this to take four to six tissue, sam tissue samples of the small intestine. Um, Celiac disease is a patchy disease, so you may find a couple really healthy villi popping up and they could take that sample and you would say, they would say, you don't have celiac, you're fine, go home, you know. But um, there was a study done in 2008 and they went back to see how many biopsy specimens took to diagnose celiac disease. So um, people who had two specimens were diagnosed 90% of the time, three, 95%. If they had four or more samples, they were had 100% accurate diagnosis of celiac. Um, so that's really, really crucial to have. Um, and the pathologists also may call it mild villus atrophy. They might not actually refer to it as celiac disease, so you need to check in on that. And it takes a good pathologist with experience in CD, sorry, celiac disease, to really recognize it. So do your research prior to starting your testing. You don't want to go through this and have someone not familiar with celiac um, doing your testing. And then finally, there's genetic testing. Um, people with celiac disease have certain HLA alleles. Those are DQ2 and DQ8. And you have to have one or both of those HLA alleles to be positive for celiac disease. And if it comes back negative, then it rules out celiac disease with a 99.5% confidence level. Um, so this is the way to do it. If you've been on a gluten-free diet and you want to see if you actually have celiac disease, you need to best, the best way to do it is do the genetic testing because a lot of people, when starting a gluten diet, getting back on gluten after they've been gluten-free, there's been, it, it's very detrimental to one's health and, um, can do a lot of bad things and it's just miserable in a lot of ways if you actually do have celiac or gluten sensitivity. Um, so it comes back negative. The problem is it can give a false positive because about 30% of the general population will have one of either the DQ2 or DQ8 alleles, just um, naturally. So you need to have the biopsy done as well to rule out, you know, a good test to rule everything out. Um, this test is especially good, again, for people who have gone on the gluten-free diet prior to diagnosis, for people with young children who don't mount the IgA response, and people who have parent kids of parents who are celiacs to see if, you know, the, if their child, little Johnny, or, you know, little Fanny is going to have uh, celiac disease when they grow up. So um, Prometheus does a blood and saliva genetic test, um, but there are many other companies that offer them as well. And again, these are just simply guidelines. I'm not a doctor. Um, this was taken from Shelly Case's gluten-free diet speech um, she did recently. And everyone's case is different, so talk with your doctor, work with them on that. Um, it's not, this is just showing you it's not cut and dry. It's hard to get a diagnosis, so you gotta, if you really believe you have it, you need to work for it. Um, and this is a great way to start a conversation with your physician. And finally, if you do have celiac, 10%, 10 to 20% of first degree relatives will most likely, will actually, excuse me, will be positive for celiac disease. So your first degree relatives should go in for genetic testing if you have a confirmed diagnosis, even if they're showing no symptoms. Um, to see if they have it. Okay, I know there was a ton of information. Thank you so much for sticking with me. Again, any questions, email me, tinsley at celibo.com. I'll post some links for you. I hope this helped. Hope everyone's doing well out there. And as always, it's from have not to have in gluten-free dining. Thank you so much for watching.